Yeah, yeah. Okay. Action. Uh, I just thought I'd put up a few sprites here to, to, to give some real life examples of what the professor was talking about. So, everyone knows what a basis point is. 100 basis points is one percentage point. Cash goal, as in physical gold, typically has sort of a four basis point spread. Futures, gold futures, the near term gold future strangely always has a much lower spread than cash gold. Um, well, it's a rigged market. Well, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What that implies about marketability for the trade. Is it the leverage? Probably, probably. I think the market makers are forced to, to make as narrow a spread as possible, yeah. So cash silver is, is typically sort of 10 to 15 basis points and silver future is between sort of three and five basis points. US stocks on average are about three basis points. And UK stocks are between seven to 10 basis points. So that gives you a sort of spread of different. These are assets, <coughs> by the way. But, uh, when it comes to gold futures, the interesting thing is that in a crisis situation, big, Chunks of future mm. contracts are thrown on the market, mm. and then your spread disappears. Yeah. It's just yeah. It's a, but the cash market doesn't behave the same. Way. Doesn't doesn't behave the same. No, it, no. it just keeps. It, so you know, it, it, it's actually because I monitor these spreads apart from the stocks. I monitor these on a daily basis, and uh, they don't actually change that much unless you do have. A sort of a violent market move, and then you see you see it oscillating, but it doesn't actually oscillate for very long before sort of spreads normalise. So even when gold is falling, let's say twenty or thirty dollars, you know, in the space of, of ten minutes, you know, the spread doesn't go from one to two to let's say nine to ten. It might go from one to two to let's say three to four for five minutes, and then it will come back. It will come back. So, market making is a very, very hard business to be in, <coughs> unless you're already a market and, maker. And, and not many people realize. No, not many people do. Very hard. Now, uh, the, the very frequently asked question is that well, perhaps gold at one time had this uh, uh, constant uh, spread, but not anymore because look at how volatile the gold price is. So how do you answer that question? Uh, and again, amazing the ignorance of people, uh, I'm talking about people at large, who just assume that uh, the gold price, the US dollar price of gold, depends as much on the quality of the paper as much on the quality of gold. <laughs> and since the dollar price is in terms of dollar price of gold is in terms of US dollars, the volatility of gold <coughs> price could be due to the volatility of the uh, price of the dollar in which it's co quoted. And uh, just people don't realize that because their daily thinking in buying and selling and, and so on is in terms of paper money. But you see, paper is paper and gold is gold. So uh, it's not gold that is volatile, but it's the dollar. And there is no reflection on the quality of gold there's a reflection on the quality of of the dollar and that, that has to be carefully explained so I want to explain prepare your questions please because I'm going to finish this shortly but I want to explain the word hoardability 
because here is another very important human need. I've already talked about the need of carrying value from one place to another. In other words, transporting value over space. The same way you could ask the question, what about transporting value over time? And this is a very, very important question for human beings because we are not, uh, we are, uh, the word, uh, gods are immortal and we are mortal, right? So we are going to die and we know that. So in other words, we, uh, and worse than that, we are aging, and as we are aging, our uh, capacity to produce is going down, and our need uh, is going up. Think of medicine, doctor's bill, and so on. So, if we are aware of that, and want to protect ourselves, and our spouse, husband, and wife, but also, if you forget about aging, we just take a simple thing like providing for the education of your children when they are small, then you have a problem that you want to carry value over time. As I say, the most uh, obvious example is provide for old age. And this is very topical because uh, the government said, no, we'll not worry about that. Just spend it, live happily. Uh, we'll, the government will take care of your old age and so on. And people bought that. Uh, sure, when all these security was brought in the United States, there, uh, for one uh, uh, person who was old enough to draw old age, there were a hundred workers paying into the Social Security Fund. And today you look at the same number and you find that for one person who is drawing social security, there are only three or four workers paying into the fund. It's a big difference. <laughs> and you didn't have to be a, a rocket scientist to predict that as the system became uh, uh, more universal, this number is going to deteriorate and it will eventually cause the system to collapse. But uh, normally an individual, an economizing individual, would provide for his or her old age by carrying value over time. So the question arises, what's the most efficient, what's the optimal way of carrying value over time? And then you look at at your choices, uh, would you save uh, in terms of uh, agricultural goods? And then the answer is no, they are perishable, so they will quickly lose value, and so on. Then you zero in on metals, but the, the big difference between metals as far as marketability in the small is concerned. And then after you have thought it over, you realize that the way to carry value over time is to build up a, an inventory bit, bit by bit, bits and pieces, small bits. And then when you, your time comes, you are no longer a productive work, and so on, then you draw down your inventory, and then you have to sell, and then you support yourself that way. So, uh, this, there are losses involved. When you build up your inventory, 
their losses and by drawing down their losses again. But there is a way to minimize that, and the way to minimize it is precisely this idea of hoardability in the small. You are looking for the one for which the uh, spread is still widening, but widening uh, least of all the others. And here is a little surprise, because originally it wasn't gold which answered that need, but it was silver. silver. Uh, you see, uh, the, the silver coins were the coins used for paying wages, for example. The gold was just too valuable for that, and the wages were uh, if you wanted to pay wages in terms of gold, then uh, uh, it would be just two small coins which you could lose, or uh, there were problems with it. But silver was just the right size, and therefore <coughs> the dichotomy between cattle and wheat survived even as recently as the 19th century when they still had bimetallic <coughs> monetary system that was in particular the monetary system of the United States. Both silver and gold coins were <coughs> mandated by the Constitution. The U.S. Mint was established by the Constitution of the United States. Central Bank was not. No mention of central banks in the U.S. Constitution. But the Mint was mentioned, and the Mint had to produce these coins. The word we use for it is that the Mint is open to both gold and silver. People could take their gold to the Mint and exchange it for ounce uh, ounce for ounce uh, for the same <coughs> weight of <coughs> gold or silver coins. Had to be the same fineness, otherwise there was a charge for uh, refining a gold assay charge. But if you had the right fineness, no charge, no senior age. Kings in the Middle Ages imposed a levy on uh, coining gold. You could still t convert your gold to coin. Uh, however, there was a charge which was called seniorage because it went to the monarch who uh, made the facility available to the people. So this is how uh, the duality of money uh, survived. Now, something funny happened at the end of <coughs> the uh, 19th century, in particular the date was 1871-72, uh, uh, silver started plunging in value relative to gold. The traditional ratio between gold and silver was around 15. Gold was 15 times more valuable than silver, uh, which meant that the same value, if you carried it in silver, was 15 times heavier and that's why silver was not really uh, marketable in the large, because if you had to transport it over a distance, you had to carry a weight 15 times as big, so that's not fair. But when it came to marketable in the small, silver beat gold, up until 1871, when all of a sudden there was a this was the beginning of a slide. Let's put it this way. One ounce of silver, the dollar price was, say, in the order of one dollar and 
29 cents. And at the depth of the depression in 1933, one ounce of silver you could buy for as little as 25 cents, which is gold cents, you see, gold cents. So that's a plunge of five times less valuable. So something very big happened, and uh, it uh, has never been properly uh, explained or even research why this thing happened. And therefore we just have to rely on, on um, ad hominem arguments. Ad hominem means not a rigorous scientific argument, but something which makes it uh, plausible to, in a, in a conversation type of situation. And this is what uh, what uh, happened. One explanation is that uh, two countries, two upstart countries, one was the United States, the other was Germany. Now, United States was victorious in the war of the states. The South lost the war, the North won it, and uh, the United States started a new page in its history and they just quietly dropped silver. It was actually carved into stone because it was in the Constitution that the dollar was defined as a silver coin. That's in the Constitution still. They quietly dropped it because they closed the mint to silver. They kept it open to gold, but they quietly closed the mint, the U.S. mint, to silver. When? Unconstitutional. Hmm? When? When did they? 1870. 1870. Oh, I'm sorry, 1870. One or two, two. I think some yeah. Crime, yeah. crime of. Well, crime they call it the, the crime of 1971, yeah. I think. A, a, a crime of 1870. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a presidential election in 1896, and uh, the Democratic candidate was uh, William Jennings Bryan. A fiery orator, a very great orator. He could, you know, those uh, preachers in the States who, like Elmer Gentry, was one of them, who could whip up uh, emotions in the crowd who were listening. He was a similar type of religious preacher, but in this case political. And he said that thou shall not. Uh, crucify, crucify man. Push down that golden crown of thorns on the brow of labor. We go back to silver, that's in the Constitution. In a way, he was right, because this was unconstitutional. But at the same time, uh, it was also inflationary, so it's it's very difficult to do justice to this. But the the point is that this was done underhandedly, the uh, closing of the mint to silver, uh, and the other upstart country was Germany. There was the Franco-Prussian War, so originally it was Prussia, but. Once they beat France, I think in, 19, in 1871, then Prussia was uh, so powerful that it could force the unification of all the little tiny German principalities and mold it in one big state, Germany and the Reich, that was the first Reich. Hitler's Reich was the third one, but <laughs> this was the first Reich. So uh, it was an upstart country, and they 
were envious of Britain, how successful Britain was in running a gold standard starting in the year 1717 by no, a person no less important than Isaac Newton, who was the master of the Royal Mint in London. And, uh, and uh, that meant dropping silver again. So there were these two upstart countries, very powerful and getting more and more powerful, who politic, for political reasons voted for gold monometallism. And uh, now, I, I'm not going to take sides. Uh, sometimes I feel that silver was artificially suppressed uh, after 1871. And sometimes I feel that silver has gone through a natural transformation because, and now you can make another argument for uh, technological reasons. What happened was that uh, metallurgy, the study of metals, the chemical and physical properties of metals, has reached a very high level uh, over the 19th century and it became much cheaper to isolate gold in small molar quantities and measure them. Pre precision measuring of weight and fineness, all this which comes with it, which was no problem with silver because the, the unit value of silver was bulky enough. Just think of a, a dollar coin, that was no problem to uh, weigh and so But when it came to grams or even smaller units of gold, there was a problem. And that was eliminated with the development of metallurgy. So you could say that whatever advantage silver had, ever had, and it did have a very, very significant advantage it was more marketable in the small than gold was. It could beat gold. The only metal which could challenge gold was silver because wages had to be paid in silver because people could carry value over time much more easily with silver than they could with gold. That advantage just evaporated. So gold commanded the whole field, marketable in the large, marketable in the small, it was gold. So there are these two arguments, and I have at one time taken the side and made publications committing myself to this view, other time the other view, and I came to regret my decision that I committed myself because I am still not sure to this day what actually happened. Was it a political interference on the part of these two countries, the United States and Germany, which wanted to get rid of silver, dump all the silver on the world market, thereby depressing the price? Or was it this natural technological change which uh, made uh, uh, gold universally valuable, whether in the large or in the small? I still cannot answer the question. When did the stocks to flows ratio of silver start to decline? What, what, what do you mean it, ha it hasn't? I, I, I've studied this question. My answer is that this was a huge change. And as a result, the silver, the, there were lots of silver mines in the world. Uh, lots of them in Europe in particular, you know that the word dollar come, another etymological question, where did the word dollar come from? It's from the German word Tal, T-H-A-L, which means valley. In particular in 
today's Czech Republic, there is a place uh, which was called in those days, it was Austrian, Joachim Star, the Valley of Joachim. By the way, Joachim was the father of uh, the Blessed Virgin, Saint Joachim. Uh, this is just beside the point, but I, <laughs> I, I as, as you know, my hobby is etymology, so a little explanation. So the word taler was that silver coin which the Spanish took over and then the United States took over and that's in, carved into stone on, in the Constitution of the United States. It's the uh, milled, called milled Spanish dollar, which is the def definition of a dollar. That comes from the word, the German word taler. So to answer your question, lots of, lots of silver mines in Europe, all over. It was pockmarked. The map was pockmarked with silver. <coughs> now, when the writing was on the wall that two important countries, Germany and the United States, are going to dump silver then what happened to these silver mines? They started mining silver like crazy. They knew that if they are one day late in delivering the silver to market, they will get much less for it. The, the silver market the price was dropping so uh, heavily. So there was a, what's the word, uh, when you exhaust your resources, uh, too quickly, there was a deplete. Hmm? Deplete. depletion. No, uh, <coughs> well, anyhow, there was this effect of depleting, deplete. Okay, depleting your silver mines too quickly uneconomical. It wouldn't happen in a normal situation. So... Exhaust. Exhaust. Uh, and, and these mines were completely mined out. Completely. Which meant ruining <coughs> the silver mining industry for a whole century. <coughs> so much so that whatever silver was produced for a hundred years was <coughs> byproduct of uh, mining some other metal, mostly copper, but could be nickel and this and that and that. So the industry, silver mining industry, mining silver for its own sake, rather than for the sake of copper or whatever, was wiped out. And therefore that had a tremendous effect on this uh, stock to flow ratio because uh, there was a, a huge, just like in the case of gold, much bigger stores than the annual flow. And this just got reverted because now the flow became a trickle and the stock started being depleted because there were industrial uses for it. So I would say that this is just another aspect of the same problem, that silver got demonetized. The question which I cannot answer is whether this was artificial or this was natural. Could be a mixture of two. But uh, I. I gave up and I decided I will not <laughs> go deeper into this because uh, we just don't have enough information. It looks to me that there was a conspiracy, but no documentation of that. Certainly it looks that there was a conspiracy involved in the U.S. Treasury because they prepared the legislation for Congress and there was a list of coins which had unlimited, you as an individual, had the right to 
unlimited coinage for each coin. Now, the US dollar, one dollar piece, was such a coin. You could take an unlimited amount of silver to the mint, and they were obliged to exchange a coin for you into these dollars. No, not this, not uh, for half dollars, not for quarters, not for dimes, but for the US one dollar piece. And that's what we express when we say the silver was the mine, the, sorry, the mint was open to silver. You could take any amount of silver and they were uh, the constitution uh, made it mandatory that the mint will uh, coin that into, uh, which is clear what it means. It means that it was the individual, it was the people who decided what the amount of money in circulation should be. It was not a central bank or bank or government or bureaucrats or elected representatives, but it was the people. This was a right which the Constitution reserved to the people. And they could also decrease the supply of money by melting down the coins. That was understood that the, the people had that right. And this right was taken away from them just like that. And it looks like a conspiracy because the US Treasury prepared the text of the of the uh, of the law, which for Congress to vote on, and they just quietly dropped the dollar coin from the list. Nobody noticed the difference, and, and even the silver mining in the states and the silver industry in the western states, there was a silver lobby, and they were watching like hawks any kind of legislation having to do with silver, you see. And uh, they didn't notice why. Because the market price, the world market price of silver happened to be above the mint price. So nobody took silver to the mint because if you had a surplus silver, you just sold it in the world market and uh, got a better deal. And that changed because it, it constantly fluctuated. And when the world price of silver fell below the mint price, then the Western states and the silver mines woke up and said, what? We, we cannot take unlimited quantities of silver to the mint and convert it into dollars? What's against the Constitution? Ouch! So they immediately started complaining. And it was too late because by that time Congress has pa passed the uh, bill and it became an act. And the, the, So it looks that there was a conspiracy. They prepared this and they pulled this fast one on the silver industry of the western states and actually on the Constitution of the United States. And they never changed that. So this is the story, and it's not a, not a, a, a happy story. There was a lot of suffering connected with this and so on, and I think the tampering with the Constitution actually it started earlier because the, uh, uh, the Lincoln, Lincoln during the Civil War started tempering, you know, the, he brought in legal standard paper and so on and so on, but let's not get into that. But uh, further questions? <coughs> well, no question, but as, a, as the only German, I think it's my obligation to point out that the Prussian dominated uh, Reich, Kaiser Reich, was the second Reich. The first one was the Holy Roman Empire, the Heilige Römische Reich. The, the Reich that you mentioned was the yeah. second Reich, not the first Reich. 
the, uh, this was after the Franco-Prussian War. Yeah. That was the Second Reich. That was the Second okay. Reich. It's just the point of the Holy Roman Empire from 802. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first Reich? What was the first Reich? The, the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire. Oh, the Holy Roman, yeah. sure. Okay. Sure. Well, actually, we were in uh, the, the city in Tyrol called Hall. Hall. It's not far from Innsbruck, east of Innsbruck. And there is a mint there. And a very old, I think, 13th century castle, fortified, that impressive tower, its beautiful surroundings, the mountains on both sides of the, of the Inns River. And uh, uh, I was invited to give a talk by the Austrians on on uh, on um, gold and silver money. So I had to do a little bit of research. But what I found after was just so fascinating that I actually delved into this question and uh, the old the intrigues of the Holy Roman Emperors, the papacy, and uh, the clergy, and the little princes, and so on. It was just fascinating. And actually, the Thaler coin was not the first coin, because the first coin was didn't come from Joachim Stahl in in uh, Bohemia, today in Czech Republic, but it did come from the mint in Hall, the Tyrol mint in Hall. And uh, it was called Golden Groschen. The combination of the gold room was a coin, Groschen, uh, Groschen uh, and the combined. And it was slightly bigger than the Thaler, a similar coin. And, and it, this is what started the revolution in, at the end of the Middle Ages and beginning of the Renaissance. Tremendous prosperity all over Europe and spreading all over the world. And I came to the conclusion that what happened was that the Austrian Crown Prince, or Archduke, I think he was called. Uh, his name was Zizigmund. Zizigmund, is that the pronunciation? Mm -hmm. He. Sigismund. 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 He was not a king, he was not an emperor, he was just an archduke, but a very enlightened one. And he opened the mint in Hall to silver. And this opened a new age, the tremendous prosperity, the trick, because there was a coin, a good coin. Before that, there was just a depreciated silver, worn uh, and uh, diluted silver coin. No more silver content in the coin than 10% or 15%, something. Uh, nobody respected this coin. And, and he was the one who introduced that coin and opened the mint. And, and there were silver mines in the area, in Tyrol, high mountains. And, and all the silver was drawn to the mint, and uh, the money was available, and industry, trade, commerce developed, the age of prosperity. And then later on, uh, the Staller started competing with the Golden Groschen, and the Thaler won the day because this became the coin for almost 400 years in Europe and uh, through Spain uh, it became the coin of the United States as well and we still use the word dollar which is uh, with reference to silver coin. It's a fascinating story and uh, there was another 
uh, Austrian Habsburg uh, monarch, in this case, uh, Maximilian I. He was cousin to Archduke Zizigmund. And in fact, Zizigmund, before he became the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Zizigmund gave Tyrol to Maximilian, who was his nephew. And, uh, and the two together worked on this project of opening the silver. So that's, uh, I learned this only a few months ago because I, I, I thought the, the story is so absolutely fascinating. And there, now this mint, the building, uh, uh, is today a museum and there are various equipment showing the different stages of technological development, how they were striking these silver coins and, uh, and uh, there was one big invention which was at the heart of this opening the mint to silver and the big invention was that Previously, the, they had blanks of s silver and they had to be struck individually, you know, and hand, uh, made by hand. And you just imagine how laborious process, and inefficient process this was. And then the invention was that they created uh, strips of silver and then they had machinery still made of wood and powered with uh, hydro with uh, some uh, streams and uh, harvesting power and uh, this wooden made uh, machinery the silver strip went through this machine out of that strip, what happened? A tremendous improvement, and this made it possible to open, open the mint to silver. And it was in Hall where this happened. And you can go to that mint and find, find uh, the, see this, they make them, they demonstrate it to you how these machineries Around what time, Professor? Around what, around what time did that happen? It happened in uh, precisely 1486. 1400. And if you think back... The end you, of the Middle Ages. The end, and, and the beginning of the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think without referring to money and silver in particular you just don't un you won't understand the renaissance it was a tremendous change in the arts in the sciences people like michelangelo leonardo da vinci and so on hundreds of them coming and and adding their talents and they never talented people before too but because of the constraints there's not enough money and the money there was was not reliable it was just uh, diluted and uh, inadequate open the meat you see the same thing what newton did 300 years later in england with gold and, and that change made a difference. So there is this tower uh, in the castle where this mint was located, and now it's a museum. And we climbed to the top observation desk, and there is a, a, a book, the book where you can visit the visitors. The visitors. So I went there and I wrote in, open the mint to gold. <laughs> <laughs> so if you visit, please remember Innsbruck is a beautiful city. Did you, you see it? 
Huh? Did you sign it underneath that? Oh yeah, it's there. So if you go, you must climb to the tower. You can't miss it because that's the main attraction of that small uh, town uh, hall in Tirol, uh, about eight kilometers uh, from Innsbruck to the east. It's uh, on the main line of the ra rail, uh, but also autobahn, and, uh, and it's well worth a visit. I can I can warmly recommend. So you go up to the tower, look up my inscription, and then sign it to a second, the second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor say aye. <laughs> okay, any question? I would that one still, if we have elaborated quite a bit on the history or more of a further back history of, of silver, could you perhaps briefly comment on, on, on the more recent history on, 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 uh, of silver, say beginning of second half of uh, 20th century? Because I think it's quite interesting to follow what happened thereafter. What yeah, yeah. There, there was this tremendous uh, dest destruction done to the silver industry and so on. and. And uh, the uh, above ground silver stocks, the huge stocks in the United States, but also in Europe, uh, started dwindling. Industrial uses uh, took up the silver, and there were less and less and less, and people could predict that the silver right, the price will explode, and so it did in 1980. Uh, an ounce of silver at that time was uh, $45. It's huge, big. I mean, today it's what, $18. Uh, it's almost unthinkable, but there was speculation and other factors. And. Uh, uh, Hunt Brothers. Hmm? The Hunt, Hunt Brothers. Hunt Brothers, in particular, an American. Uh, investor and um, his brother were accumulating silver in the COMEX, paper silver, and when they wanted to convert it into cash silver, then they suspended <laughs> the rules. <laughs> so that, that, that's a, this big story. But what stands out to my mind is that if you read commentators, analysts who make it their profession to understand the silver market, they say that the industrial consumption of silver wiped out the inventories. And in fact, there is this manipulation of the silver market by short selling and so on. Well, I don't buy that. I don't believe that these very big inventories of silver were used up in, in photography and medic medicine, and there are lots of other applications of silver, in particular the ele electronic industry, because silver is still the best conductor of electricity. I don't believe that the industrial applications used up. What I believe is that, sure, so much of it has been used up, but another very large chunk of the silver inventories, the monetary silver, which were no longer needed in trade, was hoarded. And I don't believe these tales about short uh, uh, sh short, naked, naked, they call it, naked, <laughs> short, shorting of silver. The people are selling uh, silver short in the hope of the price going still lower when they can cover their short position and make profit that way. And, and, I, th I think those people who sell silver, paper silver, uh, they are covered somehow 
could could even be that the Chinese uh, give order to uh, Chinese historically uh, they were on the silver standard way back before our civilization and our monetary history started and the Chinese have silver spread all over the people who are hoarding it uh, in small, very poor people otherwise, but they have silver and uh, so does the Chinese government and it could be that it's Chinese silver be behind this. I don't know, and there's no way to find out. But I think that very smart people who were wealthy realized early on what's going on to the monetary system. And they started hoarding silver. And I'm uh, talking about the Great Depression of the 1930s. They realized that silver was an ext extremely good bargain at 25 cents an ounce. And there is no way of losing money if you just keep adding to your hoard of silver. And just imagine for 25 cents it went to $18. At one point it was 45 cents. So that was of course an aberration came back again but the fact is that this uh, so much of that silver <coughs> is still around but people who do that they don't advertise I have tons of silver but I actually do know people <coughs> who have tons tons of silver uh, deposited in banks in Switzerland and other countries and they are not going to relinquish their whole or part of their whole <coughs> until the silver price will be in the hundreds of dollars. They just hang on to it. They have nothing to do. The Chinese themselves are like that. Why would they sell silver? The Chinese, they have a surplus um, you know, and uh, they have enough paper. They are suffocating. They are drowning in, in their paper, U.S. dollars, and so on. So the, <laughs> it would be crazy for them to sell silver, and they have. Believe me, the Chinese do have silver. So do the Indians. Right? <coughs> yep. They have silver, and and uh, in, uh, there is even a religious okay. belief. Yeah. It's, it's intertwined, intertwined with religion. Yeah. With religion. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, both uh, the Hindu Hindus and uh, Hindu Hindu uh, specifically so the u the universe was said to have been created out of a seed of gold. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Actually, the, the the heavens were formed out of the golden half, and the mundane parts of the universe were formed out of the silver so half. Uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. so it's intrinsically linked. But other religions as well. Um, well, they were quite keen to sort of dissociate gold from religion about 5,000 years ago with the, with the Jewish faith. But uh, yeah, in the East, yeah, definitely. Zoroastrians. 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 Yeah. When they came out of Iran, they went there yeah. as the Parsis. Parsis. When they became the Parsis. They also had that religious attachment. Ladies and gentlemen, 12 o'clock, we have to adjourn. Continue at 2.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're ready to begin the afternoon session.
where we develop the theme of arbitrage in its broadest sense possible. So over to the professor. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> whether it is recognized or not, arbitrage is the driving force of the market process. It is present in every market action, even though sometimes it is hidden. It may not be generally recognized that barter, direct exchange, is uh, an example of arbitrage because it is a sale and a purchase telescoped in, into one single transaction. Also, it is not generally recognized that a purchase just a simple purchase is an example of arbitrage. Now why is that? Because when you buy something, you are actually also rejecting the nearest alternative <coughs> which you could have bought also. So there is a choice involved. You have chosen something and rejected something else. So in a very general sense of the word, this is also arbitrage. Now you might find this a little bit uh, far-fetched, but there's a reason for considering arbitrage in this very, very general sense. Because then we can fit the world into a single big picture, as, as you will see. Arbitrage is also a market strategy which entrepreneurs use when they shift the emphasis for, from sales to struggles and from prices to spreads. So one of these we have already discussed, shifting the emphasis from prices to spreads. Let me start by explaining the other shift which is from sales to struggles. Uh, uh, struggle is a market term which uh, market participants use. A struggle is something which you think of when you think of the rider on a horseback with two legs on either side of the horse. The same way We think of a sale as being balanced by a purchase at the same time. And we are going to call the sale and the purchase by a name. In particular, the sale is the short lag of the straddle and the purchase is the long lag of the straddle. Let's give an example. Perhaps I invite you to give an example yeah. of a straddle which is fairly common so that everybody yeah. will accept it. Yeah. Going short Unilever stock and going long Nestle stock. That would be an example of a uh, of a straddle. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, no, so th that's assets. Yeah. That's or you could change that to let's say shorting shorting cash wheat and going long corn 
that would be mm -hmm. an example of a straddle. Um, a lot of people talked about silver, gold and silver and the ratio. And historically, the ratio has been around 15. It has been sh lo sh uh, less than that also, but for a long, long time, 15 was considered as a sacred number. But the ratio has been much higher than that also. What would the historical high be? I think it did get to a hundred. Yeah. I think once or twice yeah. it hit the one hundred. So there was a wide range. And a lot of people do what you call bimetallic arbitrage. For instance, if they expect, we are right now, the ratio of gold and silver. 63 and a half. Something like that. And a lot of people are betting that it is going to go back to the, or closer to the historical 15. So these people are going to use arbitrage to cash in on that expectation. What would that be? So in that case, you would, uh, and I don't recommend this, per se, <laughs> uh, you, uh, you, you would have to borrow gold, go short of gold, and with the proceeds you purchase silver. Well, so if, if you have, happen to have gold... If you happen to have gold, you can just swap it into, uh, into silver, so you don't, need to, you don't need to borrow. If you're starting from zero capital, that's what you'd have to do. If you have an inventory of gold, uh, a sale of gold into cash and a purchase of silver would be the way to enact that, that spread. Uh, any favorite example from the floor? Anybody can uh, uh, say what his or her favorite straddle is? Well, not, not necessarily favorite, but you do a time straddle to be short today and long three months down the road or vice versa. Yeah. The times struggles as well. So uh, these examples, and you can think of many others, uh, illustrate what a struggle is. And I would say most successful traders, or even ordinary entrepreneurs, businessmen, are thinking more in terms of struggles than in terms of a purchase or a sale. For example, a manufacturer, a manufacturer who is in the business of selling his own product. That's his main business. But he doesn't think that way. He thinks that whenever he sells, he has to provide the input. Uh, his production pro process can be visualized as a, as a pipe with an input and an output. And the output end, he is a seller, but at the input end, he is a buyer. So he is looking at the straddle with the sh short leg being the output and the long leg being the input. And this is a very fruitful way of thinking. I'm not saying all of them do that, but I, I would be quite uh, confident to suggest that the most successful entrepreneurs are thinking always in terms of struggles. Whenever they buy, they, the uppermost thing in their mind is that ultimately they want to sell. And whenever they sell, they know that they have to replenish <coughs> inventory which they are using up in the process of uh, selling. So it's arbitrage. Buy something and sell something. Very often this is simultaneously done but not necessarily. And uh, we already talked about this yesterday, very often it's a transparent connection between the long leg and the short leg. 
but doesn't have to be so. And in the case of the most successful entrepreneurs, it's, it's psychic almost. Uh, he sees a connection between something he buys buying and something else that is selling. And it's a mental connection and he's successful precisely because he can see this which his competitors are not able to see or not able to see as clearly as he does. Now the important thing about the spread, which is the difference between two prices, which may not be obviously related, but they ultimately are. The important thing about the spread is that it does change. And the change of the spread is the secret of making a profit. Again, I talked about this yesterday, that the pure entrepreneurial profit is the one which is available to those entrepreneurs who can see this invisible connection and they can act, they can do something and as a result of his intervention the spread is going to change. In some cases it's going to narrow, in some cases it's going to uh, widen in a way which will help the entrepreneur to uh, reap these pure entrepreneurial profits which are liable to disappear. They are very volatile and if you don't act fast enough then you are too late. Forget it. You just have to look for something else. Now even without any intervention on the part of the entrepreneur, the spread is changing. And reading that, that change is more important, being able to read that change is more important than reading price changes. Price changes are mostly random. In other words, if you want to explain uh, any particular price change from one moment to another, or one day to another, or one week to another, this may be a futile effort because most of it is noise, just like static noise in the telephone or radio or television, which uh, uh, is not helpful even if you spend a lot of time trying to analyze it. This is not the case with the spread though, because changes in the spread are much less random. Uh, and, uh, particular change in the spread would have a reason and the astute entrepreneur is going to be able to diagnose that cause and he will be able to act and take advantage of that change. And that is the secret of success in many cases, or I would say in most cases. Now in order to uh, make a system out of this uh, rather complex situation, it's useful to classify arbitrage to three broad categories. And that's what we are going to do here. I will write down the three categories which <coughs> we will analyze separately.
<coughs> so we are going to talk about horizontal arbitrage. And we are going to talk about vertical And the most common form of arbitrage is neither horizontal nor vertical. We refer to the uh, bid ask arbitrage. Perhaps I will explain them in the reverse order because this is the easiest to understand. This is the next step of being complicated and the most controversial probably will be the horizontal arbitrage. But mid-ask arbitrage is what the market maker does. In every market, I would call it a well, well traded market. So there are lots of buyers, lots of sellers. There will be specialists who take advantage of the wide spread between the asked price and the bid price. So there are suppliers, there are buyers, and there will be, for the same type of commodity, there will be asked prices quoted, there will be bid prices quoted, and if the spread is wide enough, then there will be specialists who are neither buyers nor sellers per se, but they will buy when the asked price is low enough, and they will sell when the bid price is high enough because they can turn a profit in this way. So they, they make it a business to buy, to buy and sell as the opportunity arises. And they are the only ones who can buy lower and sell higher because most other people just come to the market have to accept the fact that the asked price is higher than the bid. So uh, th this is how uh, the markets work. If the, there was no s positive spread, then the market would dry up. There would be no sellers, no buyers. But as it is, it takes a specialist to spot those opportunities when you can profitably buy and turn around and sell at a better price. And uh, we can consider these uh, as the people who oil the market, so to speak, make lubricated, they make uh, transactions possible because uh, when a buyer c comes he doesn't have to wait and uh, spend time just to pick the best price because he can go to the specialist and accept uh, his price because he knows that the, this uh, fellow already took advantage of it and spent time and studied the situation. So this is his best bet and therefore he just buys and can go home. And the seller, the same thing. He would come and go to the specialist and know that this is the best deal he can hope for and uh, sell and uh, go home. And the market is be, uh, acting very efficiently. Uh, now, what is 
the outcome? What's the result of the activity of the market maker who is uh, buying at a lower price and selling at a higher price, at the same time being a buyer and a seller? <coughs> well, he keeps buying and he keeps selling, and as a result, of uh, almost simultaneous buying and selling, he is closing the bid-ask spread. He is making the market more efficient. The market is inefficient if the bid-ask spread is very wide. But with the activities of these market makers, the efficiency is increased, which is measured by the shrinkage of the spread. This is, yeah. I hope, this is almost yeah. self-explanatory. Yeah. A very useful kind of activity. And in almost every uh, well-traded market, you will find these. By the way, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the market maker is called the specialist. He's, uh, he's, he stands ready to buy and sell, almost in any quantity. He will quote a different spread uh, for large quantities, and another one for smaller quantities, but he is expected to uh, keep buying, and of course, when market uh, tur turmoil shows up, then uh, he is very important. Without him, the market would freeze up and activity would stop, but this would uh, be very, very rare because the market uh, specialist will stand ready to do business with anybody at, in any quantity. But we are not really thinking of the uh, stock market here or other uh, markets such as bond or paper assets, what we are thinking of uh, commodity markets. So that's the easiest to understand. Now, I come to the uh, vertical arbitrage. It's called vertical because in a production process, We talked about the producer whose production activity we can visualize simply as a pipeline with an input and an output, but it's better to <laughs> put this pipeline in a vertical position. And the input is higher and the output comes out at a lower level. So let's simplify things and call this, uh, the input is, uh, a production good or several production good, better skill, better still, call it a basket of uh, production goods which enters the pipeline at the upper end, we call it the input level, and after the production process, the consumer good, the ready-made consumer good comes out. And again, it may not be a sing single consumer good. It's better to think of a basket of consumer goods because there will be byproducts which he can also sell, although he has a main product, but usually the outcome is a, a basket of consumer goods. So we talk about we make an abstraction. This is the practical situation. Pipeline, vertical, input, output. But it's very, very helpful to think of this as also an arbitrage. What the producer does is buying his input, which is a basket, and selling his output, which is another basket. So it's a straddle. The short leg is his output, and the long leg is his input. Please try not to think of this as being 
far-fetched or artificial or um, uh, because it is very helpful to think of this that way is and, and then you will understand much better how a producer if he wants to be successful in what he is doing is actually in the lookout for favorable spreads. He wants to, before he invested one penny into a production facility, buying the uh, real estate building uh, factory, f furnishing it with machinery, etc. Before he, he looked at the landscape of all the spreads and he made baskets of the higher level goods, which are the producer goods, and, and this is all mental. He hasn't done anything yet. He's just thinking, what should he do with the gift he has, the gift of seeing the best spread and then putting it into action, building a factory and so on. Or most, more importantly, when, we ha when he already has the factory, and then he runs out of profitable production uh, processes, then he looks at what should he modify in order to make it better. We will come to that. So this is a very useful thing to look at the producer, manufacturer, that he is an arbitrageur, <coughs> he is using what kind of arbitrage? Vertical, because he has a pipeline which is, we think, is in a vertical position. You feed the input at a higher level and the output comes on at a lower level. And uh, this model fits every, even the most complicated situation because you are working with baskets. The input is a basket of producer goods, output is a basket of consumer goods. And this is a straddle. The long leg is the input, the basket of producer goods, and the short leg is the output, which is the uh, uh, basket of consumer goods. So this is the way we try to look at the uh, production process. Uh, and we give the same name, arbitrageur, to the producer even though uh, this is less obvious that there's an arbitrage than in the case of the bid spread where the specialist uh, or the market maker was very clearly doing arbitrage. <coughs> it's less clear here, but still, I think most of you will accept. So I go to the third one, uh, which I call horizontal arbitrage, and I'm sure you will resist here uh, more strenuously against the use of the word arbitrage, because this is not part of your common experience, even though you practice it, on a daily basis, because we are all uh, buyers of consumer goods. We buy food, we buy shelter, we buy clothes, we buy books, we buy what, uh, whatever you want to buy, and it's not easy to see that there's an arbitrage there. So uh, there is arbitrage, because I already mentioned that, when you buy, you have cast a vote and you cannot take it back and change because you have already paid for it, the deal is finished. But in doing that, you have rejected the best alternative or the nearest alternative. So it could be two different brands of toothpaste. And when you bought this one, uh, this brand, you have rejected another. And we consider 
this as the long leg and the nearest alternative which you have rejected is the short leg. It could be actually a shift of your custom. You have used this brand of toothpaste for years and then uh, your neighbor suggested that there's uh, a new uh, brand on the market which uh, he tried and he found very good and recommends that you do. So you uh, tried and became convinced that this is really an improvement and then you shift your custom. You abandon the old brand and you keep buying the new brand. This is an arbitrage whenever you shift. But even if you don't shift, but you just have the, avail the available choice and you buy one and reject the other, it's useful to think of that activity as a, a virtual arbitrage. Because then the big picture will fall in pa into place. You are doing a jigsaw puzzle and, and that fits and immediately you get closer to your uh, to your end. So the uh, horizontal arbitrage is called horizontal because you can do it at the consumer good level and you are doing it willy-nilly. You, uh, you are doing arbitrage horizontally as a consumer on a daily basis, like it or not. But more importantly, the producer is doing, or has to do, a horizontal arbitrage when he is refining his production process. He's constantly looking for alternatives, which could be either cheaper or higher quality. These are two usual reasons why the producer would shift his custom just like the consumer, but it's more important for the uh, producer because his life depends on it. You as a consumer uh, could be careless in shopping and don't care that it's a little bit cheaper here or the quality is a little different. You buy because you have been buying that for a long time and you have, you have uh, developed a feeling for that and you don't but the producer has, has to stand on his toes at all times. Because if he doesn't do it, then his uh, competitor will, and he will lose out. He may lose his business and ultimately lose his shirt if he is not doing horizontal arbitrage. Very important. and. And uh, producers are very much aware of it because if they weren't, they would be eliminated in short order. They would lose their business. The better uh, producers would, uh, with the help of horizontal arbitrage, would uh, be able to um, force him out of business. And this is happening all the time. So. What I am suggesting here is that to understand the whole economic picture, the big picture, it's extremely useful to uh, consciously look for arbitrage, even if it's not obvious that it's there. Because if you do, sooner or later you will discover that yes, there is arbitrage, it may not be exactly simultaneous, it may not be uh, uh, between two baskets which are obviously related, and actually it is the case when they are not obviously related, which is important for the uh, market process, because that's what's happening, eliminating inefficient producers, inefficient entrepreneurs and promoting the less efficient ones who came into the picture with smaller capital, with, uh, with um, not much of a chance, but because of their superior understanding of the big picture, they have been able to outbid or outproduce 
the established producers, the established entrepreneurs, and, and succeed. So this is, uh, you know, the competition is just shifting arbitrage. The more efficient arbitrageur will win the day. So uh, competition is not what is usually pictured in the popular literature, cut throat competition and you know the, no it's just the uh, activity of finding the best spread finding the best straddle which fits that spread and uh, doing arbitrage with the given things and that results in a picture which is changing in a constantly and instantaneously and the change here will bring about change elsewhere like a cobweb where any disturbance here will spread all over and um, the outcome is a better world so to speak uh, and it takes time and so on uh, but this is happening at all times and happening in human society dynamic picture in there is production in animal societies also like bees and, and some other uh, communities of uh, insects or even uh, higher uh, uh, living creatures but it's static there because there is no profit, profit motive, there is no uh, foresight, there is no entrepreneurial uh, insight. And it just re keeps repeating the same pattern, it changes with the seasons, but nothing much is changing, although there may be evolution there too, but that's another story. In the human society these changes are much more pronounced and very important. So to summarize this a little bit we are talking about spreads, straddles and arbitrage and they are interconnected. A straddle always has a spread attached to it because there's a buy price and there's a sale price and it's a difference. So a straddle is entered by the entrepreneur because he discovered a promising spread and he wants to address that spread. He's knocking at it, want to, want to move it in one direction or another because this is uh, the uh, promise of a profit and he knows that this, this is ephemeral it could come but disappear very quickly so he wants to act as quickly and as, uh, as efficiently as possible so we look at the world as a big uh, play or drama of arbitrage, the uh, landscape of spreads, all possible spreads. Uh, the entrepreneur has a special eye to spot those which are promising and he's going to address them. How does he address these spreads? By putting in various uh, straddles, long leg, short leg, and through his interference, in the uh, natural state of things, he will change the landscape for the better. And it's, it's also very profitable for himself if he acts quickly. And uh, society benefits because the outcome will be a different uh, landscape of spreads which offers cheaper goods, higher quality goods, and new products which didn't exist before. Why do new products come uh, into uh, the market? 
because there are those entrepreneurs who saw those spreads when nobody else was dreaming about and he uh, invested in production facilities to create those baskets of consumer goods which then uh, will be available to you as the consumer. Uh, a laptop computer is just a basket of uh, <laughs> consumer goods. It's very clear that it's a basket because you have to buy the software separately, the <laughs> hardware separately, very often the um, uh, keyboard. keyboard is separate and the uh, monitor is separate. So you take this basket and buy it and then you use it. And the uh, manufacturer put in other baskets into his pipeline to come up with this product. And uh, 50 years ago, nobody knew what a laptop computer was. And, and there it is now. Almost everybody has not one, but several. And if you travel, you take it with you and uh, uh, use it. You could, uh, it's almost unthinkable that we could survive now in this uh, higher stage of uh, uh, society without a computer. And what would happen if uh, the internet was wiped out? <laughs> we can't think of but it, it would be terrible. And probably it's coming, they say it is, I don't know. <laughs> so that is uh, the classification of uh, arbitrage. Um, a very useful uh, viewpoint, and I might mention that the distinction of vertical uh, is due to Menger himself. He was talking about uh, not just producer goods and consumer goods, but in fact he distinguished between several stages of producer goods. And he uh, I will actually call the first, who talked about first order, second order, and so on, higher order producer goods. Uh, because a lot of producer goods are put into a production process, and at the output level, it's not a consumer good yet. It's a semi-finished good, which will be an ingredient of another production process. So he, this is a layered system of producer goods. First order is the one which is immediately convertible into consumer good by the last producer. It creates a basket of first order producer goods and then a basket of consumer goods comes out which she sells to the ultimate consumer. But there are several other layers and most of the producers are just producing something which is a good input for another producer. So the production line is a sequence of vertical pipelines and only at the bottom you have the output which is a consumer a basket of uh, consumer goods. And that's Manger, original Manger, a very, very uh, penetrating idea of his, which was developed later by a pupil of his, whose, whose name is Böhm Bawerk. But that's not important for us. The basic idea comes from uh, Menger himself. Now, the horizontal arbitrage is uh, more recent. Uh, there is no trace of it in Menger, although the, uh, the uh, idea, the gist of the idea is there, but it was actually worked out by 20th century Austrian economists who noticed this activity which doesn't even look like arbitrage is in fact arbitrage 
especially for the producer, but also for the consumer, shifting custom, shopping around for the best input. In the case of the consumer, shopping around for the best quality and the best price is arbitrage because there is always a short lag even though it may not be visible uh, namely you f forego something you you could have chosen it but you didn't you had the reason to choose the alternative so uh, this is the history now we and this is my little contribution to this. I've introduced names for the various types of uh, struggles which are involved here. I'm going to talk about four-legged straddle and two-legged straddle and believe it or not even one-legged straddle. Okay? And let's go through this as well. So no three, no three legs travel, strange to say, unless you want to invent it yourself. I didn't feel any need for it. But there is definitely four leg straddle, two leg straddle, and one leg straddle. And this, these struggles are instrumental in understanding or presenting the uh, price formation uh, and uh, the production process as well. So let's, uh, uh, actually this is going to be your t topic also tomorrow, but uh, we, since we talk about arbitrage in more general terms, I think it is helpful to uh, uh, introduce the idea right now. <coughs> now, when the arbitrageur sees a profitable spread. And let's stay abstract. So I call an item X. And then he finds a spread which is too low. And the related item, loosely related item, call it Y, has a spread which is relatively high. Then he can set up what we call the initial long lag of a four leg cycle. Initial long lag will be buying what appears to him cheap and selling what appears to him as uh, too expensive. And don't think of a producer. This is just a, more like a speculator who set up his initial struggle and sits back and waits just waits because he has uh, intuition that this spread is going to close, gets narrow. And when he th if, the mar if the market moves in his favor, which is not a foregone conclusion, then he can take advantage of his intuition and close out his initial uh, straddle by what he bought, he will sell, and what he sold, he buys back. And then he is out of the market, and he is a profit because the uh, the uh, spread has narrowed. Moved the market moved in his, fa in his favor. If this didn't happen, then he will still close out the uh, straddle. Uh, putting on to two more legs, so we still have the. But unfortunately, he had to pocket a loss 
because the market moved away from his expectation. And this is a very common practice, not just of speculators, but also market uh, 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 warehousemen, mm -hmm. right? What does a warehouseman uh, do? He, uh, he buys, fills, uh, we use the uh, example of the uh, elevator operator, grain elevator operator, who has at least two bins two containers and usually he will fill one with wheat say and the other with corn and then waits this was at market, uh, harvest time at harvest time he had empty bins and then he the, mar the harvest comes in he goes out he buys and fills out the bins and now he has to uh, this Hence, his inventory during the crop year, uh, growing down the inventory, and by the time ne next harvest comes along a year later, he will be again empty, his bins will be empty. So, uh, he is buying. But, during the year, what could happen is there he has some information which tells him that the wheat price will go up and the corn price will go down. Not immediately, but uh, within a few months, say. Because he has news about the weather in another continent which uh, in, uh, in influences the uh, uh, world market in wheat and corn and he wants to take advantage of that. So then he might say expects higher wheat prices. He will sell corn faster to make room for wheat in his corn bean. So in other words he sells purposely just to create room make room for wheat. Let's assume he sells all his corn and both uh, <coughs> uh, bins are filled with wheat. So that's a straddle because he sold the corn and bought the wheat. And then he sits back and waits for the uh, forecast to materialize. And let's assume it does. Wheat price goes up corn price either goes down or stays stationary. Uh, he has, he has uh, succeeded because he predicted the future correctly, but he still has to cash in. So now he sells uh, the wheat, cashes in on the higher price and buys the corn back relatively cheaply and he's back at the original position. So he had an initial spreadle, long wheat, short corn, and then at the end he reverses that, switches the short and long legs around and sells the wheat, replaces it with corn, and that completes his four-legged straddle. This is a very common uh, market strategy, which a lot of warehousemen, among others, the uh, elevator operators are doing. But you can apply to foreign exchange operators when uh, these uh, businessmen have a clue that dollar is going up and the euro is going down, so they set up a position, the initial straddle, they want to be long of the currency which they expect to appreciate and the other is short, and then if they have to close it out, as eventually they have to, no, <laughs> you can't keep a position open forever, then they reverse the uh, legs and close out the position and hopefully it was profitable <coughs> and they uh, have a complete four-legged 
travel. So that's the basic model, and we shall see that this model is repeated even in the two-legged straddle and the one-legged straddle as well. Questions after, hmm? questions after the break? Yeah, any questions now or after the break? Oh, okay. Do you want that? Shall we do questions now, or do you want to do them after, after the half hour break? I think after. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we are going to have a break now. Uh, you may have noticed that I didn't give out notes for this one. The notes do exist, but I didn't get around printing them, so I promise that tomorrow I will give you the notes for lecture number three on arbitrage. And I think we just uh, have, a, have a coffee break now and come back in half an hour. Great.